Okay, we're here with D.W. Kinley of Leonardo. So, D.W., we're talking about training systems. So, I'm an old guy, and when I think of the training command, I think of starting with ground school, maybe some analog simulators, nothing very Gucci, and then you get in the airplane with an instructor, and then maybe a solo, and so forth and so on, and that's kind of the continuum. Yeah. In recent times, we've discovered that that's a suboptimum way to train flight students, to train, in our case, naval aviators. So talk to us about how this evolved, yep. starting with, like you say, patch wearers and what they discovered, mm -hmm. and how this informs the system that you guys are developing. So uh, slightly less old than you, Ward. Very uh, polite, thank you. Yeah. Uh, where we grew up, uh, our training and readiness in a squadron was based on number of flights, our TNR matrix for the squadron, right? So every squadron budgets based on a certain number of air to ground events, a certain number of air to air events, division events, section events. But OPSO cruise. is called X's. These X's, X's, right? And that's all it was, right? So I would fly an air to air event, X, done. And so from this we conclude that the squadron is proficient in its mission and ready to go on cruise. Well, we all know that's not really what happened, right? Some people needed twice as many, like me, needed twice as many air-to-air -air events as, as, the, as the next guy, right? Some needed twice as many air-to-ground, or they were really good at strafe, but they really sucked at precision munitions, whatever the case may be. So we knew that there was something, there was a disconnect between the way we were tracking and the way we were, at, and what we were actually getting. A great example is the greenie board. So as a, as a squadron CO, I had, just like everybody, we had the greenie board on the wall, right? But it wasn't just the number of OKs and fares that we tracked. It was every single aviator, this one gets overpowered and closed. This one is struggling with lineup in the middle, whatever. So we went beyond just the grades, just the events, to actually think about where were these aviators doing well and where were they doing poorly, right? So now we get into about the 2015-16 time frame. And as a test pilot, it's hard for me to say anything nice about patch wearers, but I'll try. There was a, a, an astounding study that was done that, that, that me measured air wing dead and fallon, and they measured valid at trigger squeeze, valid through time of flight, valid at timeout. That's all they measured. And they, and they checked in the debrief, did the aviator get it right? And what they came out was, was really scary. The, the short answer was no, most of the time. And then they broke it down by demographics. The ones that were the most proficient shocker were the, the patch wearers. The ones second behind them were the lieutenants that had just finished their level threes. And on down it went from there. COs and XOs, not surprisingly, were near the bottom. And we all knew this intuitively, right? I mean, in our heads we knew this person is struggling a little bit for whatever the reason may be. This person is doing really well. But here for the first time we have data that you just can't argue with and the room goes quiet, right, as we're considering the ramifications of this. So there, so there are lots of things that came out of that, but one of them was, how do we measure proficiency rather than just number of Xs? Okay, so the tactical world has, has I think, evolved beautifully, and there's a lot of great things happening in Fallon uh, right now um, with uh, the LVC environment that they're doing out there. There's an LVC, is, and I've done an episode about Live this. virtual constructive. This is combining live aircraft, that's live, with virtual, that's aircraft and simulators, with constructive, these are computer generated. There's a bunch of value to the LVC, uh, and we'll get to LVC in just a second for, for the training world. Um, the value as a, as a former program manager uh, from a cost point of view, I don't have to put 20 airplanes in the sky anymore, but the real value now is I can get lots and lots and lots of reps and sets. The other value is I can start uh, measuring things that I couldn't measure before. So what if I told you I could measure where your eyes were? I could measure whether or not you were task fixated. In some cases, I could measure or not whether you fatigued. I could look at response time to certain inputs, right? And it's starting to get a little scary AI, right? But, but I mean, I'm getting to a place now where I can actually start measuring your proficiency, not just whether or not you flew the X. So again, the tactical world is moving in leaps and bounds in that direction. And I think what we're seeing in the training command is they're starting, to, they're starting to move in that direction. The other thing I would say that's different now is when we grew up as kids, um, your airmanship was the thing that mattered. So when I took you through the training command, how you flew the jet was what I really needed to measure. And to some extent, that's not changing. But the cockpit that's, that the kids are flying in today, if I can say kids, is a different cockpit than the one we grew up with, right? It's about data management. So, so the suffusion of, of data and how the person in the cockpit is managing that is become as important to some extent as their actual airmanship. And in fact, we're getting to a place where the jets are, I hate to say it, pretty easy to fly. 
right? They're fast, but they're easy to fly. So there's a lot more attention made on, on cockpit management, of, of, the, of data management, of managing all of the other aircraft in the sky with me and not just the airplane I'm in. So the training command has to evolve with that, right? So um, what does that mean in the training command? It means that we need to start changing our paradigm. There are some advantages we can do because the simulators are starting to be a lot better than they used to be. When I was, uh, when I was active in the fleet, um, I discarded simulators because you weren't really learning how to fly the jet in them. But things are beginning to change. And again, with the, the difference now in, in cockpit management, the value of a simulator is, is becoming kind of, a, kind of into its own. Furthermore, uh, what, we've, what we've begun to see, and we see this in the tactical world, we're beginning to see it in the training world, is this idea of earning the right to fly, right? So uh, back when we were kids, you jump in a jet, division, you're dash four, all I care about is don't lose sight, don't run out of gas, right? Well, but you've wasted a division flight. That's an expensive flight to, to just don't run out of gas. So what if I put you in a simulator and let you fly time after time after time, and you have 20 repetitions flying that mission as dash four? Now I put you in the jet, and I'm actually trying to get tactical training out of you. See what I mean? Yes. So that there's this idea of, of, of getting the best value out of the time in the airplane. We're not looking at replacing flights. That was pretty controversial in the discussion. I think that's a mistake. I still believe you get your true training and airmanship in the airplane itself. But I can, I can maximize the time in the airplane by, by sending you through the, the reps and sets in the simulator. What we're seeing in the training command is uh, the, use, the use of the simulators in, a, um, in the old way we've done it, which is uh, emergency procedures, uh, buttonology, you know, figuring out you know, just how the airplane, maybe some instrument training. So that's not gonna change. We're still gonna try to do that in the simulator. We're still gonna do the checkout flights in the jet. But then once we transition to things like air-to-ground training and air-to-air -air training and some of those, and even some SCLP training, um, we put you in the sim, we get you used to what you're gonna see, we fly it over and over, we can measure how you're doing, because the simulator gives us opportunities to see things about your responses that you just can't record in an airplane. Then you climb in the airplane and we know a lot more. I just happened to be at one of our facilities um, in Italy where um, they're actually, uh, they have a, an AI training manager, believe it or not, that is making recommendations to the course instructor that says this particular aviator is, 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 is very good at this particular task. Let's not waste any more money there. This, this one here, in my case, struggling a little bit, not doing so well. We probably need to spend a little bit more time in the classroom, in the simulator, whatever. We need to double down here. So what we're finding with some of our students in this international school is uh, almost a bespoke curriculum for each one of those aviators based on what we're seeing. Before you ask the question, the AI is not determinate, right? right? It still says to the instructor, this is what I'm seeing. You make your own decisions about how you're going to change the course. So the AI doesn't rule the world. Um, but we are seeing a lot more data in the hands of the schoolhouse now than we used to see, allowing for a much more efficient, I would argue a much more effective uh, coming out the other end. What I like about that DW is it kind of takes the, the personality that, you know, we dealt with the flame yeah, flight yeah. instructor and the guy who had a, a, sh a ship on his shoulders, Check. you know, all of these things where you're like, the reason I got two below was that, Check. right? And when you talk about things like head work, these sort of subjective elements yeah. or line items in a, uh, in a debrief sheet, in a grade sheet in flight school, what you're telling me is AI, which is kind of a charged term, right? yeah, some negative yeah. connotations, but let's just say white hat AI is making recommendations, data-driven recommendations okay. on things that we couldn't measure before. If you can see where my eye is going and the speed at which it goes there, that's just a data-driven assessment that right. we couldn't have made if you're sitting on the console next to a guy who's flailing. You couldn't have made an assessment like, it took you too long to pull the fuel shutoff in. Mm -hmm. right? Now we can say it took you four seconds when it should have taken you one. And, and, the, and the baseline performance yeah. is yeah. two seconds. What I love about what you're saying, as the old guy, and some of this really freaks me out, what you're talking about, Yeah. but all of that is taken out of it. Now I'm not saying that instructor talent doesn't matter anymore, I'm sure that's not what you're saying. No, absolutely not. But there's something cool about this, something amazing, and this really does define a generational shift in the approach. So how does this manifest itself in a system? What are the building blocks of this that, that will in turn meet that task? It starts in the classroom, so every student sits down in front of, remember turning box and screen? It's the same, it, it looks similar, although okay. it's, it's much higher tech than what we had. Um, and with the instructor giving basic classroom instruction, 
basic tests. This, none of this is going to strike anybody as, as new or weird. Um, and, the, and the measures that come out of that are the same measures we had. Got an 80 on the test, got a 90 on the test, whatever the case may be. Then we move into uh, something that looks a lot like what you're seeing behind you. Now this is what we call our smart chair. Um, one of our uh, Textron test pilots is, uh, is flying it for us today, Jojo. Uh, and uh, Jojo looking good. <laughs> Not that he can we see We call us. him Rails Jojo. <laughs> um, so, uh, as you can see, you have a stick and throttle, but, you, but you, you're not, you don't have the representative cockpit, right? So you're missing some of the, some of the, the, the feel. So this is where you're going to go next. And again, you're going to start with basic EPs. You're going to uh, buttonology, uh, uh, start up, shut down the basic processes of how to fly the airplane. So far, we haven't done anything really exciting. Then we're going to start to transition you as we move out of just learning the basic fans in the airplane. We're going to start to move you into some of the more mission stuff, right? Uh, air to ground, air to air. So the, so the, the skill set that we're trying to build in them, call it a lead-in fighter course or okay. lead-in fighter training. I think yep. they call it lift. Uh, so they're learning some of those basic skills that, that you and I would know. They're doing low levels. They're doing NVG. They're doing air to air refueling, but they're also doing basic air to ground deliveries. They're doing um, EBR intercepts, and they're doing some within visual range, you know, kind of BFM stuff. Here's where we start to track you, right? Here's where we start to watch eye movement. We start to to, be, to, to sort of modify the, the training uh, syllabus for the specific aviator. There are certain waypoints in the in the syllabus where we say, all right, you know what? You are ready now. If you want to graduate to this next point here, let's put you. In an airplane and let's fly this thing. Or, in a lot of cases, there's a there's a simulator that goes beyond this that would look familiar to you uh, that has the cockpit, right? So now you have the no kidding feel of the, the switches and we, and we continue with the process. Throughout all of that, you're gonna get in the jet, but most of the time when you're getting in the jet for a mission event, you will have flown it and you will have been measured on it several times, uh, several times until you get to a level of proficiency where, you know, you get in the airplane and it's not gonna be something new to you. In some cases, I can predict how long it's going to take you to get through this course. In some cases, it's going to be a lot faster, and in some cases, it'll be slower. So the predictability of turning students out every six months or, or whatever the, 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 the number's going to be uh, has changed slightly. So I'm in class 0324. Yeah. Right? And so you and I are together, and you take to a per certain part of the syllabus, and you're, you move on to you know, be fast to add fast before I do. Yeah. Because I'm trying to think, how does this manifest itself in terms of you get your wings way before me now, or you get through the rag way before I yeah, do. Yeah, but didn't we do maybe? that in flight school anyway? I mean, when we not when really. I, finished... I mean, we, your class all kind of stayed together, yeah. right? Because it was exits, and even if, let's say you got two above, so I got all averages and whatever. There was no mechanism like you're talking about. This is the aha moment. This is the generational yep, yep. improvement. Is there was no mechanism to go? You only need two, DW. Mooch needs five. There was no way to do that. You were going to get five. That's true. I was going to get five. So what's going through my head as you're speaking, almost on the negative side, is um, I think one of the things that Admiral Brophy would tell you that he's learning at Sinatra is there's some value in the in that cohesion, that class cohesion. I believe so. So I think there's a balance there, and I'm going to yeah. go outside my lane here. So you're, everything you're saying is true. I mean, the, the the value of what we're seeing at IFTS is I can I can produce a known quantity, whether that takes six months or nine months, or four months or five months, whatever the case may be, I can produce a, a, an aviator with a certain skill level. That's a good thing. There's no variability anymore in what you're getting out the back end, but the time frame could be variable. Okay. And the, the balance, of course, will be, yeah, but there, there's value in that class cohesion of studying together, of running EPs against each other. So I don't know how to strike that balance, um, but you, you bring up a good point. Is Leonardo Offering the entire system, is that what's, what the competition yeah. is, is soup to nuts, including an airplane? The, the initial discussion with, uh, with Sinatra, that when they put the first request for information out, it talked about the entire integrated training system. Um, as you know, we've, uh, we've taken the aircraft carrier out of the picture. Well, I, I wasn't um, sure of that. That's my question. That, that so appears to have been well CQ decided. CQ or, or carrier, Training Command CQ isn't a thing anymore. Um, I don't know that I've seen it officially, but I hear, I understand it's, it's pretty well decided. Because right? I had this conversation with Kenny Weitzel when he was Airbus. Yep. The old guard yep. guys are like, you've got to be kidding me. That's a rite of passage. That's, it's like, hey, the data set with the first test group showed that they did really well in the That's rag. right. So what are you going to the mat about, old guy, gray beard? Yeah. Right? Then he did talk about um, preserving the ability for uh, aircraft to do touch and goes at, if needed well, on of course the ship. Aircraft do. Okay. Um, so, no well, okay, so that means it needs to have at least carrier suitable struts 
Yeah. But you got to be able to land at 700 feet but per minute. It. Whether it has the tail hook or not, can it land on the boat? Or are we just flaring at the field because of service life? And obviously a Check. training system will last a lot longer if you're landing well, it like an F-16 instead of an F-18. Okay, so well, actually you said two different things and I think it's important to break this down. You said tail hook and then we talked about flaring. So let me, let me separate them. Okay. So what I believe has occurred is we have pretty well decided we don't, we're not gonna buy an airplane with a tail hook. Okay. When you think about um, an airplane designed to trap on a boat, the entire airplane was designed from the tail hook forward, yes. right? I mean, you have to. So the, the, the keel of the airplane, if you want, is designed starting from that point of view. Yes. Well, none of the airplanes in play right now are meet that, are, are satisfy that point of view, right? Okay. All of them exist today. Because of the design efficiencies, cost efficiencies, service life efficiencies, this isn't because we think, it's not, you know, like, that we think that kids these days can't hack it or whatever, right, right, right. whatever socio, right, right, right. you know, division would be put on this decision. It's because this is the smart move against what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there's another revolution that's happened and that's PLM, but let me get to that in just a second. Oh, okay. I love PLM, right? Yeah, it, I was, I put a magic carpet in the F-18 and it has changed the You were the at game. PAX when that happened? I was the F-18 program your... manager. Yeah. Okay. But we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. So the first thing you said is tail hook. I believe, and again, I, I wait for the Navy to officially corroborate this, but I believe that's out of the picture. Okay. And um, part of that, I think, has to do with the cost and technical risk of putting it on these existing airplanes. I think part of it, if you look at it from Sinatra's point of view, their schedule is very much at the mercy of boat, boats availability, right? Yes. And so, so when you talked about a, a predictability of students coming through, they, they are living and dying by a carrier being available on X amount date, right? And a carrier would rather not do training command CQ if they didn't have to. With love and respect, they need to go forward yeah. and defend the American people, et cetera, et cetera, yes. right? The second thing you said was SCLP, it's constant AOA all the way to touchdown or flare. That's, that's a similar but different question. Okay. But it has similar ramifications, right? So a normal airplane like an F-16, as we all know, um, because it can flare, the structural requirements on the landing gear, on the, on the keel of the airplane, are less than you need on an F-18 or an F-35C or whatever the case may be because of that, that constant banging, 700 foot per minute or whatever the, the constant um, uh, banging would be. So all of the competitors in the, the uh, uh, undergraduate joint training, undergraduate jet training system, the, uh, the T-45 replacement, are all looking at this question of what does it take to modify these airplanes to support FCLPs? So you can do constant angle attack, Check. BSI to touchdown. Just like you did in but the But you don't need a launch bar. Yep. And, and you, you don't, don't need, need a hook. Right. So let me switch gears and talk about PLM because it'll come full okay. circle. Okay. So uh, what we did with uh, what is now called precision landing modes, what we called at the time magic carpet, was we changed the way airplanes work in the groove. So when an airplane rolls wings level at that 18 second groove length, when we were kids, when you manipulate the, the longitudinal stick, you're moving the tail, you're changing the AOA of the airplane. Yeah, that's how you are affecting where you are on glide slope. Every airplane that's ever designed ever since the Wright brothers, that's how they control pitch. That is not how PLM airplanes control pitch. What they're doing, when you move longitudinal stick in PLM, in path or in rate, you're changing the camber of the wing. So your longitudinal stick doesn't move the tail. It changes the, the leading edge and trailing edge flaps of, of the air. Or, so you're, you're changing the camber. And if we're super dorky as a test pilot, I would love to draw you CL Alpha curves. <laughs> we'll do that on another episode. Another day. If you look at an airplane in the groove, the nose doesn't move at all. Right. The AOA stays constant. But here's what's really sexy about PLM from a program manager's selfish point of view. The variability around that airplane landing has been collapsed greatly. Specifically, the sink rate. So the average sink rate is a function of physics. It's just the glide slope, right? But the, but the bell curve around that sink rate, and it, it, especially on the hard side, is much less than it used to be because the variability, there's no AOA departures anymore. The airplane is basically just flying a, a rails all the way down to, to touchdown. So that offers us an opportunity. Whereas before I needed to design an airplane for a really hard worst case, that worst case has gotten a, a lot Better. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. Because yeah. the, the worst sink rate is much less. That bell curve looks more like a spike than a, than a wide bell curve did anymore. So what the Navy's working on right now, and F-18 I think is the only airplane in the world that's gone from pre-PLM to post-PLM. And as I can tell you, as the program manager, the reason we did PLM 
was because of fatigue life on the airplane. It wasn't to make it easier, although that it did do that. Uh, it was based on fatigue life. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. We, we were losing wow. eight airplanes worth of life just from SCLPs every year, okay. and we had a readiness problem. Okay. Okay. So the the benefit of PLM is in 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 uh, reducing the amount of structural pain on the airplane in, when it's coming into land. So, do I have to modify an airplane in order to meet that? Well, it depends on what those numbers are. Right now, it, it actually looks it, it looks pretty promising. You know, we, we, have, we have yet to hear the final numbers from the Navy. That will determine what we need to do because we have two problems. One is the instantaneous landing. Two is the lifetime of landings and, and the airplane being able to manage that over its entire lifetime. And that worst case number is what's going to drive that. So we're, we're, we're waiting on that from the Navy. Uh, my, my, you know, back of the napkin math looks like we're, we're in actually pretty good shape. So when is this contract being awarded? So what I'm hearing is, is that we're probably talking about the EMD on this replacement airplane happening in the 27 time frame. Okay. First airplanes delivering in the late 20s, 29 time frame depending on lead time, but it really depends on funding availability and how bad the requirement is to replace T-45s. But a lot of the things we're talking about, I think, is still a work in progress. If I had to imagine what will happen as this as this competition plays out, what you'll see is um, the, the awardee will probably be selected, um, and then there will be a collaboration between the awardee and Sinatra as they begin to refine the, the curriculum from there. Makes sense. I don't think we're going to see a fully formed, refined curriculum before the request for proposal. Okay. I think what's going to happen is that, that that final picture of what this looks like at Sinatra and Kingsville or Meridian or Pensacola, um, I think it's going to be driven by a collaboration between uh, the Navy and whoever ends up winning. That makes sense. How many companies are, are in the mix currently? So we have uh, Leonardo with the M346, it's the okay. airplane we've been talking about. It's a dual engine, non-afterburning. Uh, the airplane that's flying today, training the fifth gen. Boeing has a T-7, single engine afterburning airplane. They're the ones that, are, that have been selected for the Air Force uh, T-38 replacement. Um, so they're spinning that up. And then Lockheed has brought the T-50. It's made by a company called Kai in South Korea. It's also single engine afterburning, a uh, pretty capable airplane as I understand it. But that's, those, are the three, those are the three in play today. Well, DW, thank you for your time. It's Good my stuff. great pleasure. We'll have to go sidebar on PLM. I want to talk Absolutely, about that Absolutely, anytime. Time. But uh, thanks for giving us the time and a great explanation today. My pleasure. All right, that'll do it from the Leonardo booth here at Sea Airspace. More to come, so stay tuned.